afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the biotech and healthcare session. Before we start, I would like to ask some background question. So if you are working in biotech or healthcare industry, can you raise your hand? Okay, thank you. And uh, if you're working in academic field, can you raise your hand? Thank you. And how about industry field? Okay, so we have a little uh, background understanding of our audience. Um, so, hi, I'm Lydia. I'm currently a senior staff scientist at Toys Bioscience, and today I'm going to the moder I'm going to be the moderator of this session, and I'm going to interview our two awesome speakers, uh, Danny and Eric. So, before we start into the questions, I would like to let our um, panelists to introduce their background and their current job function. Let's start with Danny. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Damien Trail. I'm currently an associate professor uh, in the School of Medicine at Stanford University. Um, I originally came from Taiwan and I came to the U.S. Um, I spent quite some time in Boston for my uh, training period. So I, I got my PhD from Harvard and then stayed at Boston. So I, uh, I went to MIT for postdoc. And then uh, in 20... 14, I moved to U of Utah, so that's in Salt Lake City, uh, to take my first faculty job. Um, um, that's the time when I first experienced the time to be an independent uh, principal investigator, and then uh, around that time, I started to work on, um, I mean, now we will call it metabolic research, but my focus is more on blood glucose control. So. Um, that was the time when I would say, um, I mean, we'll talk a lot more about that later, but that was the time when people view research related to metabolism. It's a little bit boring. You know, that's something you learn from your biochemistry classes with a lot of those pathways, uh, different metabolites converting from one to the other. But of course, things change quite a bit these days with all those anti-obesity drugs. So now, this is kind of in the train again, and we'll talk about that later. But, uh, around 2020, uh, I, uh, my lab moved to Stanford and then I, I, I took the job um, in um, Stanford School of Medicine. And then um, earlier this year, I received my tenure, so uh, they won't kick me out now. Uh, but, uh, but basically, we continue to do our research related to this field. And then um, and some of you are from uh, academic institutions, so you know that in addition to basically all of those research directions we are very interested in. Uh, there's still a huge component of training the next generation of scientists. Uh, uh, that's kind of part of, uh, part of our job. And thank you, and we'll talk more later. So next will be Eric. He's uh, a strategic planning manager. So can you describe your job function and the current role? Yeah, sure. Um, Eric Du here. Um, so currently I work for the R&D strategy planning group uh, with Estellas. Um, so when we think about strategy, right, there are usually two aspects in, in the context of biotech. One is asset strategy, where you think about you know, what kind of product you're developing, right, what kind of research is necessary, what's your competitive position, et cetera. Now, the other side is called non-asset strategy or organizational strategy, where we look at how the business is run, right? We, uh, uh, we would look at the operational efficiency of the organization and think of ways to transform and to, to make it better, to make it a better uh, engine to support these assets. So that's where I work. I work in the uh, organizational strategy. Um, so the, uh, the team that, I'd, um, that I work with, we were essentially a, a group of internal consultants. And um, you know, we would go around and uh, we try to align um, the company's growth targets uh, with its commitment to financial sustainability. Right? You need to strike the balance between the two. Uh, otherwise, you could have a hundred of good ideas in the lab, but if you don't have that corporate engine to um, execute and deliver, then it's not going to amount to any uh, you know, business sense, right? So, um, so what we do um, a lot, I mean, I can't share uh, specific details, but people in our role would try something like revamping the uh, organizational structure, implementing new technology, writing on new processes, um, thinking about strategy to deal with you know, suppliers or vendors. 
all these things. So essentially, uh, I would say, to, to summarize, I would say that we are operationalizing innovation, right? We make realistic steps to make great things. Thank you. So our next question is that we can hear it from our speakers. They switch from job to job, from locations to locations. So how do you make decisions um, to leave a job and to join a new uh, environment? How, uh, can you talk about your job tr uh, transition? Let's start from Eric. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, unlike Professor Denny here, uh, I actually failed my biochemistry uh, in college. <laughs> so it's a little surprising that I'm on this panel. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I sort of majored in, in, in partying, but they gave me a degree in neuroscience, so I have no idea how that happened. <laughs> so after graduation, um, I worked in a, in a neuroscience lab for a year, training monkeys. Um, I, didn't, I didn't like them, they didn't like me back. They sort of behaved like my two-year-old daughter, but imagine there's like 20 of them, right? So I couldn't take it. Uh, so I decided that I wanted to work with people, not just monkeys. So I uh, pursued a career, a degree in public health. Um, so I spent some time, I spent my uh, master's thesis in Africa. Uh, it was a bad time in Africa back then, but I'll save that story for later. I came back, uh, you know, decided that, hey, I wanted to save the world, you know, alleviate poverty, uh, give you know, free health care to people. Uh, none of that happened. <laughs> I, I ended up joining a, uh, a uh, public health consulting firm. We service the uh, US federal and state, state level government and try to advise them on how to run some of their disease prevention programs. Um, I like public health. Um, you know, it, it really used a lot of multidisciplinary uh, knowledge. But what I didn't like was that things were going too slowly. So I was looking for a career pivot. Um, I, um, I wanted to become a diplomat, so I, um, I passed all the tests with the uh, US State Department. I didn't end up going because I just started a relationship uh, with a girl and who is now my wife. Uh, so that was a good decision, a great decision. Uh, but I still wanted to, so I stayed in America. I still wanted to you know, uh, you know, do a pivot. So I went back to school, got an MBA, and uh, I started working for a pharmaceutical company called Gilead. So you can, as you can see, I, I did like a 180 turn. Right? I went from giving free drugs to everybody to let's make money on the people who need the most, right? <laughs> it really messed up my mind. Um, so I worked in Gilead in their R&D strategy and operations. Um, so we look at you know, operational efficiency, you know, how to uh, build some new capabilities uh, to help the company scale up and become more efficient and more you know, competitive uh, in the company. Um, but what I did uh, more unconventionally is that uh, instead of uh, just my, doing my day job, um, I volunteered a lot of my time uh, for different projects outside of the R&D function. So I worked with government affairs, medical affairs, commercial um, and also corporate affairs, and also liaised with uh, different industry groups like pharma, bio, and also the U.S. government. Um, so I did a lot of these things, and um, what I found is that I am, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a journalist, right? And I really like this kind of um, uh, approach to uh, my career development. So I decided I wanted to become a full-time consultant. So I joined KPMG, a consulting firm called KPMG. I joined their strategy consulting group. Um, so our clients hail range from big pharma to medical device to life sciences tools. And we would provide growth strategy, uh, margin acquisition due diligence, and uh, focus advisory uh, to, to, to our clients. Uh, did that for a while. And, uh, and then the economy started you know, turning upside down, right? So I got laid off. Uh, I was on a job hunting for about eight months. And finally landed this job with the CLS last year. And you know the rest of the story. Thank you. Yeah. And um, for Danny, we know that you start from East Coast, um, switch from schools to schools, and how do you make these decisions and transitions? Yeah, so for academia, everything is more stepwise, right? So we all have some sort of experience in different higher uh, high education institutions. Normally, you, you, know, you got your PhD you know, in our field, biomedical field, you do a postdoc, and after that, you go for your independent position. So, there's not as many terms as what Eric described, but um, I, I I actually have a little bit different background in the way that I actually always think about as a different choices. So if you want to 
find the, uh, the common ground between Eric and myself is I actually, literally, I was interviewing for a consulting job uh, um, when I was doing my, uh, right before I graduated from my PhD. Um, I actually spent the last year of my PhD time uh, in, the, uh, in the consulting club. So every Wednesday night, I would practice the case and then try to I could end a job there, but in the end I decided not to go for that. Um, which is actually kind of quite interesting to what Eric just mentioned. Um, I was very afraid of being a journalist. Um, I actually tried to see if I can have some sort of core expertise, and that's actually part of the reason why I went to um, I went to do a postdoc. So I received my PhD degree in chemical biology. So I got trained as a chemist uh, uh, from college, and then um, I got influenced by the environments in Boston. Uh, we know that that's an environment unlike the Bay Area. I mean, Bay Area still have lots of biotech going on around, right? So lots of you are in this industry, but there's a pretty huge tech component to dominate it. Um, in Boston, that's pretty obvious. That's a very heavily biotech dominated situation. So I got influenced there. I was originally a pure organic chemist. But I got influenced by the environment there, so I switched my field to chemical biology. Um, after I got my PhD, I was thinking about going for management consulting, but in the end I stayed to do a postdoc, but I, I always want to learn something new and different in a way that I can expand my expertise. So I actually went to a chemical engineering lab uh, at MIT to do some bioengineering. And the reason why I went there is I started to do experiments with animals in a way that I can be closer and closer to the drug discovery um, path. And then since I started my own lab uh, previously at Utah and now in Stanford is we keep doing more and more. So I used to only do mice experiments and in the end do more rats. Now at Stanford because we have a bit more resources to do different things. Uh, my lab is probably running one of the larger um, pig studies uh, in the whole campus, so we can still go for that. Uh, just, just a uh, pretty funny thing. You want to learn something uh, as a scientific fact today. So the reason why we do pig studies is actually because pig and human skin are the most similar. Okay? If, you, if, if you have uh, pets, you know, dogs or cats at home, you'll know that they have blue skin, right? So it's more like mice. But if you want to do something, test something that requires subcutaneous injections, that means you inject a rat on various skin. Mouse and rats are not the best uh, models, and we need to go for pigs because they are like us. Uh, they are, we have more fats around their skin, so that's the thing. So that's why we do something like that. Um, so um, if I want to say what's the common thing or where you go for, in addition to the, I would say, the traditional academic route of kid moving out, keep climbing the ladder, you know, your position-wise or your ranking is, I always try to do my best to learn something in, in the way that we can basically, you know, still learn something and still expand what we are doing. And then, um, I would say the, the, the special part about, say, Stanford versus lots of other academic institutions. So, for example, I was in School of Medicine at U of U, Utah. That's, that's also a very, very good, um, medical school and that's actually one of the best ones there because uh, it's the only one in a 500 miles um, 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 radius. So basically they control a lot of resources there. But really the special thing of an institution like Stanford versus the rest, it's not that other places are not good. It's really in the area there's a lot of you know potential opportunities to spin out what you are doing and to expand increase the scope of your research uh, activities. And that, uh, and that will, I will say that's something I really enjoy here and uh, potentially um, try to do a bit more and you know, try to convince myself that staying in academia, there's still a lot more for us to do in addition to the you know, daily you know, related research or teaching or administrative jobs. So Danny, on your path to Stanford, which part do you think is most challenging? Is it like writing grants, working day and night, trying to get students? Which part do you think is hard? Um, I'll say in different stages of your career in academia, you have different challenges. And of course, when I was an assistant professor, 
the most difficult thing is trying to set up a lab, right? And, and that's basically, I mean, if some of you started your own company, it's actually very similar to a startup CEO, uh, where you need to basically figure out who are the first people to hire. And what's the, you know, you still, you're making the decision. Like, we don't, we don't have in-house consultant, like, Eric, to support us. So basically, you need to make your own decision. You know, there are literally a million different projects you, you can do, but what is the best decision to make and for you to go with And then we, like start CEOs, we normally have a startup funding for you, you know, you know I would say, like, you major institutions are in our field roughly one to two million dollars, and you can use that money to hire people, you know, to decide what are the projects you want to work on. And then, you know, before you burn those money down to zero, you better get some funding. But that's basically, again, very similar to a startup CEO, where you, before you burn out all the money, okay, and then you need to generate some results. In our, in our field, that's called preliminary data. In that preliminary data, such that you can write a grant and convince the government or nonprofit foundations in specific disease area to give you additional funding such that you can continue on the work. So a lot of similarity between a startup CEO and basically a student professors in a major academic institution there. Um, I would say the only difference is the I mean the university still provides some other function you know, where you need to focus a lot more on the research side and the, you know the, those background supporting group, you know, I, I don't need to worry about the finance. If there's someone more like a CFO uh, in the university to do it, and the person will meet with me every month to tell me about what's my burn rate. You know, <laughs> we, are, we need to bring more money before, you know, at some point, we, we, we will be running out of money, or there will be HR function or whatever. When I want to hire people, there are people trying to support. But other than that, I mean, there's lots of similarities. And then really the key, just like a startup CEO, is, you need to think about how to survive, right? And what's the what's the path for you to have a sustainable team? But the difference for us is there is no way of being acquired or you know, some sort of idea. Basically, you need to get promoted. And the way you got promoted. So let me. I mean, I just went through the promotion situation. Like right? in Stanford, the way this is, um, um, I need to write some paragraph and provide all the you know what I have done in previous years in terms of my productivity. And then um, we were required to provide a few names who are scientists who just recently got promotion in, they call it peer institutions. Um, so for peer institutions will be those, you know, IB plus places, right? And then you put it there. And then what they want is they want the reviewers to compare you with those people, just to see whether you are, you know, among the same group, among the same categories. And then, you know, if the answer is yes, they will, they will, they will give you um, tenure. So, the it's, I would say it's a bit more cutthroat compared to you know, some some other institution where there's a relatively clear criteria. Um, we don't have a criteria. The criteria is to do great science, you know, in, in, impactful work. So but but I'll say that's the main difference in the way that the way the you know, the end game is is a little bit different. Our end game is to get tenure, such that you can continue your work, your work career. But other than that, I would say it's actually relatively similar in the way that you know, there's constant challenge of what's, you know, there's the survival mode and how can you go through it. And for us, but really the key thing, and just like a startup CEO, you just need to make sure you deliver what you promise you want to do. And for us, it's we, we also deliver whatever the research direction, research progress we, we, we were hoping to, uh, uh, to achieve and then we get it done. And for Eric, you mentioned that you start from like research knowledge, and how do you elevate yourself from that to strategic strategic planning? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, how do you broaden your knowledge base and like communication skill, people skill? Do you also share the challenges on this path? Right, and uh, first to echo Dan's point, um, so. In-house council, we really don't do much, so you, you didn't miss out anything. <laughs> um, so I would approach uh, Lina's question uh, two ways, uh, philosophically and more tactically. Right? So philosophically, I would say there are three things that uh, people expect of us, and that's what we should you know, expect of ourselves. One is you know, attitude, aptitude, 
and altitude, and their importance is in that order, right? So, attitude is for most the most important part, right? Are you a nice person? Are you an honest person? Are you responsible? Um, can you, you know, are you a fast learner? Can you deliver, right? You know, are you gonna be that guy you know, at the end of the meeting just to ask one question to to get seen? Are you gonna be that that person? Are you gonna be that person who brings all the, your emotions to work and then and then guys that you know, to work well? So the you know, attitude is really important, right? Try try to be a nice person and try to be an easy person to work with, right? And then aptitude, right? Do you have enough subject matter knowledge, right? Do you have the skills? Can you do the job? Right, and, and I think that uh, will develop over time, right? So it's okay to start without that that level of expertise, right? And attitude is most important, but over time you develop attitude. Right? So now you're a nice person, and you can do the job. Right now, the third level is the altitude, right? So can you bring things up to the next level, right? Try to see things besides your own uh, your own little uh, field, right? And can you anticipate what other stakeholders are thinking, what they're asking, and can you solve problem from a more strategic level, right? So um, that's usually what people want the internal consultants or, or these strategy people to do, and uh, that's how you would, or how I would uh, try to provide my, uh, my career uh, you know, from this guidance, right? And tactically, um, there are a couple of things we, uh, I, I, I did, and I think they're really important. And one is this mentioned by uh, you know, Professor Danny, right? So, journalist versus specialist, right? And these are two very diverse uh, career paths. And uh, it's better to figure that out you know, uh, uh, as early as possible, because that would influence your education decision. And also, your for, you know, maybe for your first job, you know, where you want to land up. So, are you a... Uh, a journalist who is good at a little bit of everything, but you're not a master of anything, right? Or you're a specialist who you know who has uh, who has a, a particular domain expertise, right? And um, I mean, there are different pros and cons, right? And there are definitely uh, ways to mitigate uh, the risk associated with career path, right? Uh, but it's, it's better to figure that out as early as possible, right? Because you know, as a journalist, I can tell you uh, most of the time we would face this, with this question, right? So what exactly do you do here? <laughs> you know, uh, what do you bring to the table, right? Because obviously we don't have, let's say, a particular skill set or a particular you know, research strength, right? But what we excel at is, is uh, soft skills. How do we bring people together, right? So this is why you need to emphasize, right, as a journalist. And then another thing that uh, we should work on is networking. Because right, uh, I, mean, I mean, there are different levels of networking, right? Because the first level of networking is more passive, you know, where you just talk to people, say hi, learn about what, you know, uh, learn about you know, what, what what people do, and then also explain, introduce yourself. Right? But then eventually, you'll need to move on to uh, the next level of networking, which is you know, anticipating what the other people are you know, thinking, what do they want, and you can start trading, trading resources with. That person, right? So you can, you can trade information, trade your service, right, with that person, so that you're not just going, you're not just setting up a conversation just to talk, right? But you're actually providing a value, and that's exactly the role that you need to play as a strategy person in the organization. Because a lot of times it's about facilitation, but it's about stakeholder management, and um, so uh, that's most of the total part uh, about running uh, some of these business operations. Right, to get people to agree on something and then move forward together. Right, so networking is the key to success here. And the third thing, and the last thing I would mention is about uh, building your credibility. Because right? as a journalist, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's more difficult, right? Because you, uh, like you said, you know, don't have a pretty good degree, you don't have a particular you know, research strength. So how do you build your credibility, right? So uh, I think it's, uh, very important to deliver on your promises, right? So when you go talk to these people, you say you're gonna get something done, get it done on time, and not just get it done, but go above and beyond, right? Because you never get a second chance, right? Because as, as a journalist, if you don't deliver on the first time, people are not gonna work with you, right? So as a consultant, internal or external, that's exactly what happens, right? You go to a client, and then uh, they, they tell you to do something, and you deliver like 80%, 70%, they're, they're not gonna work with you anymore, right? They're not gonna pay money 
and, and they're, they're not going to bother with you, right? Because you're not an expert anyway, right? They can find other people to do that. So delivering our promises is, is, is the key to uh, building our credibility. Thank you. Okay. So next question is about the current situation. So Danny, you mentioned that as a professor, you're like the CEO of the lab. So you also mentioned that Stanford is an environment that encourages innovation. So can you talk about the strength of Stanford and also after pandemic, how about the government funding that affects the research? Yeah, I mean the the strength of Stanford is quite obvious to most people. Basically, it's a it's a university where basically they have lots of strengths in pretty much every single expertise. And in a way, I'll say the special part is it's actually pretty special in a way you can combine the expertise in different fields together and try to achieve a project that's with larger scale, so something you cannot be done by yourself. And normally, somebody can try to do that with you know, experts or collaborators in multiple institutions, but I think the fact that Stanford has you know, strengths in all different areas that make things easier to do it. Um, a recent example is there's a colleague of mine, um, he's a medical doctor, he actually would like to do a pump that can be implanted inside the body. Okay? But there's no such pump way to do it. So himself will he will he actually started by doing an investigative initiative phase one trial to prove that um, having a pump inside can be a good idea. And then he demonstrated that, but now there's no such pump. So he's facing two different challenges. One is he need to have that pump. And then he also needs to basically have a new drug such that when you put it inside a pump and then implant it in the body, that can still be stable and then do the job with, uh, for a pretty long time. Because right now the current job use is you know, stored out, out, outside and you can mostly put it um, in room temperature uh, or fridge, but when you implant it inside, that's 37 degrees Celsius. So the way he did it is he was able to convince a faculty in mechanical engineering to make the pump, uh, bring in for him. And then he found me to make the drug for him such that I can still work. So this is really, um, you know, if, I mean, he's a faculty uh, and physician at Stanford, but in most other institutions, it'll be pretty difficult for him to pull all these all things together. So, so I would say this is a good example. If you are in a major institution that is strong, pretty much every single expertise that will be able to go for it. Um, but now the question is, even if you have this concept. You still need to have the resource to get things delivered, right? And then, um, most of the time, for something with super, super high risk like this, and then with um, some incumbent that don't want to go for this, and that's the thing. So, for example, uh, let's still use, use the same concept here. Um, uh, this guy want to have an implanted pump. And then the company that made the pump that's put it outside, that's Medtronic. So, that's one of the biggest medical device companies, right? And of course, they do not want to have an implantable pump because that will you know, basically make your current uh, product to be useless. So this is more or less like a you know, um, um, normal gas powered car versus electric car. Right? You will need to do it by yourself and be successful before people will go for this. But the thing is, you, know, you need resources, you need money to go for it. So this is something that would be very difficult to convince the government to support. Um, so potentially, um, you would need to go to some of those nonprofit foundations where they really have the vision. Potentially, know that dollar revenue is something much better. Uh, in our case, this is for specific disease area, and then um, this physician or some this thing happen to have a specific disease, so it's easier for him to to, to convey this concept and try to convince people to go for it. But in terms of government funding, I would say this is really uh, the difficulty. Uh, of United States um, currently. Um, I will say, um, although this looks pretty good, but compared to my counterparts in, say, Maine and China, uh, they actually, in average, have better resource for academic researchers to, to pursue stuff. I actually, a lot of people who I used to work with or I know, um, quite some of them actually, you know, in spite of all the difficulty and potential challenges about the difficult US and China uh, political tension, they still decided to move back to China uh, because of the potential 
more resources they can handle to make some of these things they really want to do. Um, this is really a difficult part. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty here. So um, another e e example. Um, we have a new project, and potentially it should be funded soon. But the thing is, it will be the next physical year. And then some of you understand how government work, you will know that the physical year of US government starts October 1st. Okay, so if the next one, that means it's not ending yet. The problem is we have an election year, right? <laughs> so basically, a new budget will not be known until, okay, until the election finish, because you want to wait for the new Congress to decide. Okay, and then, you know, most of the time, our government runs in continuous resolution, right? That means they, they don't know the budget. They just run it in a way that they will assume it's still the same thing. So in that case, um, say, most of us biomedical researchers, we rely on NIH, so National Institute of Health, to give us the funding. And basically, NIH will not decide how much money to spend. They will be try to be very conservative. So they will probably only spend 60% of the prior year budget. Before they can go for, you know, make the final decision. And this year, this year, so that means this past physical year, the budget was not set until April. Okay, but think about it. The 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 um, the physical year starts October the year before. So it's not like not half a year later before they have the real budget. And it's pretty much going to be the same thing this year, potentially worse. Um, so. If you rely on only government funding to go for to support your projects, uh, this is a pretty difficult thing in the United States uh, um, in the current setting because there's a lot of uncertainty. And then now going back to the strengths of sticker, um, that means you probably will need to rely on non-government funding. Non-government funding in our world that pretty much means non-profit foundations or endowments. And then endowments is probably can feel this is probably one of the strengths for you know, pretty high ranking institutions to try to score. So endowment is a huge part of or I should say philanthropy money. That's a huge part of uh, what we rely on in addition to government funding. And that's also another strength of institutions like say for Obama or MIT because you because of the name recognition, because of, of the reputation it's easier to go for. And then so so I would say that there's indeed significant advantage in addition to the government funding here right, for major institutions like Stanford. Um, try to have some edge over researchers in, in other institutions. Thank you. And for Eric, like we mentioned that the government, the new government may affect the company's decision a lot. So can you share with us about government policies that affect the company decisions? Yeah, yeah, thank you for the nice segue. Uh, could you uh, pull up a slide, please? Um, the first slide. Um, so um, basically, I'm going to talk about some policy headwinds for biopharma in 2024 and beyond, right? So um, the Biden administration relies on three pillars to control drug prices. The first one is IRA, the second one is antitrust scrutiny, and the third one is margin rights, right? And to varying degrees of impact. Now, the first one, the IRA drug price negotiation. So basically, IRA gives the government uh, the ability to negotiate for drug prices for Medicare. And right now, they've already selected um, about 10 drugs uh, uh, to negotiate prices for, and uh, they're going to be affected starting 2026. And, and just one political comment, right? So Kamala Harris, oh, by the way, um, so this list accumulates over the year, right? So every year they could select up to 20 drugs uh, to add on to that list, right? And one political comment that uh, Kamala Harris made uh, a couple of days ago is that she would like to increase that upper limit from 20 drugs to 50 drugs. That's why some of you have heard about this sort of debate, right? So, and going back, right? So um, when the government uh, try to compile um, the list, they rely on a set of criteria, right? So these drugs, they must be expensive, uh, they don't currently have any uh, competitors. Um, they should be on the market for quite some time now, and they're not often drugs. Right? Um, so the first and foremost, uh, you know, uh, effect is definitely going to be you know reduce revenue and, and revenue stream, right? Because when the government negotiates price for Medicare, it doesn't just stay within Medicare, right? It sends a market signal to, across the board. So 
other payers will use that as a benchmark to negotiate for the commercial prices, right? So all companies still, they're, they're going to see some revenue going down, right? And uh, secondly, right, the government wants to incentivize biologics and alternate drugs. So that means for other therapeutics, uh, not part of that, you know, that group of, of drugs, uh, they're not going to, they're, they're going to be less favorable uh, when it comes to IRA. So which means patients who rely on those, those types of you know, other drugs, um, they're not going to get anything. Right? And last but not the least, right? Drug innovation doesn't just end upon FDA approval, right? There, you can, you're gonna have new inventions uh, for existing drugs, like the new um, patient population, right? New indication, new formulation, and new dosage forms, right? So if you're putting a time limit on a particular asset, you're essentially saying that um, you know, uh, companies should not capitalize on on inventing or, or making new uses for an existing drug, right? Because but they can't make any money after that certain time period, right? So uh, essentially, uh, what's going to happen is that a lot of companies will just make vanilla version of a drug that has singular results. So that's generally not good uh, for the market. So that's why I label the, the, the impact as uh, pretty high uh, for for uh, the biopharma companies. Antitrust scrutiny, right? It's happening across all industries, not just healthcare. Uh, so um, the intensity. Um, of antitrust is, is, is uh, under Biden administration is I've never seen before. It's really strong, right? What the government essentially wants to do is that they want to stop big farmers from monopolizing the market, right? And so this is just due to help small biotechs to survive and thrive. Now I can't say that I don't agree with that uh, conceptually. Right? So the, uh, the government has uh, recently published new margin acquisition guidance uh, they gave new indicators and definitions about uh, market concentration, vertical foreclosure, uh, potential competitions. Basically, the key takeaway is that M&A is more difficult to do now, right? And uh, and you can see some of the cases like Pfizer's acquisition of CGEN, Amgen with Horizon, Sanofi with Mays, and uh, you can also uh, take a look at non-healthcare uh, example, which is also highly relevant, Microsoft uh, acquisition of Activision, right? Now the uh, the government doesn't always win per se, but just by starting that antitrust investigation isn't enough to deter some of the companies from these practices. So essentially, uh, it's creating more uncertainty and a higher cost for uh, margin acquisition activities for companies. So so that part is going to slow down. And margin rights. Um, so, margin rights has been with us for a long time, right, for the past 40, uh, 40 years. What, ha what that means is that for research programs receiving government funding, you know, such as NIH, the government has rights to march in and take it away and license it to another company under the circumstances of national security, uh, economic crisis, or public health. Now, usually the government would waive this right uh, just so that they could incentivize the company. So it has never been used ever um, in the past four decades. Uh, but what Biden wants to do now is that in addition to these uh, circumstances that I mentioned, right, um, the government wants to add pricing as one of those conditions. So that means, let's say, uh, if the pricing of the drug is too high, then it could potentially trigger margin rights. Now, of course, um, this still in the talks, and uh, I think most people believe that it's never going to become uh, a reality. So uh, I label it as an impact as low, uh, but it's worth watching. Now I cannot um, talk about policy without talking about the US election. So can we go on to the next slide, please? Right, so these are the eight scenarios right now as of this week and their associated likelihood, right? As you can see, it's a very close election. And uh, the, the two most possible scenarios, scenario three, where the Democrats win the presidency and the Republican control the house, both houses. Right? And also, this is what we call a uh, divided government. Right? And scenario two, where the Repub Republicans, uh, they win everything, and that's a unified government. So what do these uh, two scenarios, uh, how, how do they play out um, for, the, uh, for the three policy headwinds that I just mentioned? Um, let's go to the next slide. 
Suppose we have a divided democrat uh, government, right? The IRA is going to stay the same, right? Because without Republican uh, Congress, congressional support, uh, Harris is not going to be able to do much, right? It's going to stay the same. It's going to increase that upper limit to 50 direct. Same with antitrust, right? Without the con congressional support, it's not going to uh, change much. And Martian right, as most uh, analysts would say, that you know, it's, it's never going to move beyond that political talk. And maybe after the election, it's going to die down as a topic. Now, if we have a unified Republican government, right, they really don't like the RA, so we're feeling that um, you know, they're, they're going to just not enforce some of the, uh, the, 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 the price negotiation rules. Right? So they're going to move the other, the other direction. Same with antitrust. They hate antitrust. Right? So most, I would say, like, Conceptually, right, Republicans are pro big pharma, so they're going to move, move away from all these antitrust you know, pursuits. Margin rights, as usual, you know, nobody's going to talk about it. Now, it doesn't mean that Republicans are are um, are anti uh, you know, drug price control, right? They have their own agenda. So uh, Trump um, has uh, mentioned a couple times that he wanted to implement you know, a most favorable nation clause. Uh, he wants to import drugs from Canada. Uh, he wants to re-import drugs that we ship out from the U.S. You know, to other countries and import them back. Right. So these are all potential uh, you know, drug negotiation uh, tactics that that they may implement. Uh, we don't know yet. Right. So um, yeah. So these are some of the uh, policy headwinds that a lot of companies are considering right now that would potentially inform their strategy in the next year or so. Thank you. Oh, that's a lot. So that's the current situation, and we have a question for the future trend, like uh, what new technologies will take place, and uh, how do we combine biotech with the high tech industry? So let's have Danny to share with us for the future trend. Yeah. Um, so Harry mentioned about IRA. Uh, that's already making an impact in some of the things what we are doing. So for example. These days, if there's a particular target, you can go with biologics or small molecules. Chances are you'll be encouraged to go with biologics because for the IRA, there's two more years of the time you can sell it. And another thing is also like what uh, Eric mentioned. It used to be companies will go with a particular drug, but they will go with a smaller indication first because they try to get things out. So potentially physicians can use it off label for other diseases. So. Uh, a, a one good example will be those anti-obesity drugs where it's first approved uh, for type 2 diabetes first and they will start to use that water indications. And that means they do do more drugs. So eventually you probably will see that they will not go with a smaller indication first. They will basically try to go with something that they can get the full market because once it got approved, then that clock is different. So that's actually making a difference in terms of say, if we are thinking about something we want to do. We want to think about long-term planning. Uh, in addition to just pure academic research, you know, I mean, because for pure academic research, you can do whatever you want. But the thing is, you are wanting about something that can make bigger impact. Because the thing is, in academia, we cannot do anything beyond the preclinical research, right? Those IMB neighboring studies, you you need to have form of biotech to support that, and not to mention all those pot uh, potential clinical trials. So these are things you want to think about. How can you engage the right partners in the future to further develop stuff and you go for? So what I can say is this is already making an impact of our you know, potential day-to-day -day decisions. But in terms of longer trend, I would say I mean these are I will view it as waves, right? You know, just like political waves. You know, we could like probably some of the decisions later this year uh, from the citizens will change some of the things here. Um, but there are some things in the way that I'll say I'm more optimistic in the way that we will for sure see some of, some of the differences. Um, I'm not mentioning things like you know, people will say that I mean, these days now there are lots of potential uh, new therapies for obesity or with oncology and things like that. You, you will always see something like that. So for example, uh, five years ago the biggest thing was immuno-oncology. Everyone talk about PD-1, uh, PD-1, PD-1, um, Kichuda, things like that. Uh, right now, people in the same oncology field, they probably talk much more about anybody drug conjugates because there are a lot more in these things. Um, but what I want to say, and then 
really related to the whole AI thing that we experience today in this conference is really I think there is actually lots of potential synergy uh, between AI and health tech. Um, what I am saying here is not just, I mean, we probably see some of the examples of, you know, uh, there's DeepMind, uh, which is a um, um, subsidiary of um, Google. They have quite some protein, uh, protein structure prediction or uh, potential protein designing uh, capacities. Uh, those can potentially help the drug discovery, but I think in addition to that, there's a lot more we can know about uh, the individual uh, level. So uh, this term has been around for a long while, called precision medicine. Okay, this normally means that instead of having a drug that is useful for you know, everyone, potentially everyone with a specific disease, but you can now think about the person by themselves in a way that you know, potentially because of the specific mutation they carry in their genome, or potentially because of, I mean, now we know much more about uh, gut microbiome. So it could be gut microbiome to influence the metabolism, or even drug metabolism, or uh, nutrient absorption, or different things like that. And then in a way that potentially, with all the technology we have, and then potentially with the uh, influence of AI, we can now start to see more. Let me give you one example, and this is more related to my individual uh, uh, academic in, in interest. I mentioned to you that a lot of what we are doing is related to blood glucose management. Okay, so we now all have, you know, most of people will, will, uh, will carry Apple Watch, right? They give you a lot of potential data about yourself, right? But I will argue, I mean, these are useful, you know, track your sleeping, track your whatever, track your steps, track your exercise, but and then, you know, blood pressure, you know, some of those things. But I would say those are probably not the most important or pivotal thing. And then, of course, I'm biased because I, I, I work on this. One of the things I'm really interested in will be what you would look, blood glucose trend, okay? Not just, not just something that um, um, you, know, you know it from time to time, but something, you can wear something like Apple Watch to, uh, to go with it. But unfortunately, we don't have the technology to support that. But there's a thing, some of you may know, called continuum, continuous glucose monitoring. There's still a small needle, you know, you will, you, you will look there. But the US now just have the very first um, o OTC, so you can buy directly um, without uh, prescription um, um, to have the first o o OTC approved uh, continuous glu uh, glucose monitor. So basically, it's a, I mean, I'm, okay, so just. Just this, uh, disclosure, I do not own Descom stuff, or whatever. but there's a uh, Descom product called Stello. Uh, you can buy it, and then basically you measure your interstitial glucose level, so close enough to blood glucose levels, uh, every five minutes, and then you will update it, you will upload it to the cloud, or from your own cloud, and then basically you can see from the app that what's your trend. So uh, I have been using it with it. Every day you will see it, and then you will think about, okay, I actually see some, Pops in the glucose levels, you think about what do I eat today and what are the things there. But now, it's still pretty manual thing, right? But what I envision, potentially, if somebody is interested in starting this company, you should start to think about this. You know, what you can wear something more like those Google Glass, you know, nobody talked about it. Like that. But, but, but 10 years ago, that was something quite important. Something, you know, in a way that they can automatically record what you eat. And potentially. I mean, now there are some apps in a way you just need to take a picture, right? And then, it will tell you what's that, and what's the approximate calorie, and then you know, all the carbs and all the nutrients um, um, in, 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 in there. Potentially, it could be a full package in a way that, you know, without much human input, you can get all those information all together. And then now, co co coupled with your continuous glucose monitor data, it could actually inform you. I mean, probably you want to do it, you know, at a minimum of, say, three to six months in a way that you Go to every single thing you will normally do. And then now, you will know much more about what are the things you want to avoid eating, and what are the things that are potentially bad for your, you know, for your health. Because I would say nutrient um, absorption is something we know that for sure from person to person. It's going to be different. And this is just one example. There are lots of things like that. And then we have some technologies to go to that. But again, like even if right now I, 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 I want to do it. It's a very manual process, right? I, like every every night I will 
think about what I have done. So I, 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 one day I saw that 3 to 4 p.m. I see a huge increase of Google levels. But I didn't get anything there. But that's because I'm exercising. And then uh, my body is preparing for potential more, uh, a, a more nutrient use. So that's why they go for it. But the thing is, things like this can all couple together. If my step, oh, my computer group, I can talk to my Apple Watch, okay? They would have analyzed it by, my, uh, 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 by themselves. So I think use a lot of integration to go with. And then not just for the Google levels, there are a lot of different potential technologies that can combine together. And then with something like AI to come to pull all the data together, try to analyze it, and then try to potential instead of just telling you some advice, but in the future potentially making some medical advice and potentially for medical doctors to get used to it. That to me for sure is a trend we are going to see you know, potentially in the next five to ten years that we can see that this is something that can uh, potentially advance what we do. So due to time, we don't have enough time to talk about the challenges after pandemic and how about the current job situation, uh, how do you elevate yourself. So after this, we have a networking room next door. If you wanted to network with our speakers, please go over there. So let's uh, thank our speakers today. One thing is, uh, for those of you who want to continue the discussion, uh, you can go to room 208, so you can mingle with our speakers. Rare chance, please take advantage of it. Yeah,